We have heard a lot, especially in the last panel, about this idea of a new kind of institution, which was the basic idea behind Cedric Weiss's Fund Palace. Can you hear me? I know it's very um, loud now, but is the microphone okay? Okay. Um, so I'm picking up on this again uh, from a different perspective. Um, I want to bring in another palace, which uh, happened in the middle of the 19th century, the Crystal Palace. Uh, Joseph Paxton's Crystal Palace, built in 1851 for the World Exhibition in London, which also was based on the idea of a new kind of institution. Here should be an image of the, oh, there it is, um, an image of the Crystal Palace, which you can hardly see, but you probably know it anyway, this large, giant glass ship that lied in, in Hyde Park in the middle of the 19th century. There are some relations between the Crystal Palace and the Fun Palace. Both were gigantic in their dimensions, both were consisted of prefabricated parts, and both were, had a temporary structure. The Crystal Palace was, in fact, seven times larger than St. Paul's Cathedral. I mean, just to give you an idea of how enormous this building was. And it was built in six months, as I said, from prefabricated parts. The assemble behind the Crystal Palace was to assemble for the first time in the history of human mankind, and I'm quoting here from a, from a paper that was distributed, the industrial products of all the educated people in the world in a comparative survey in order to present, this is also a quote, a state of the industrial and artistic, both in the same sentence, development of all of humanity through samples of their products. So let's do a little stroll through the Crystal Palace on the day of the opening, which was May 1st in 1851. So it was a huge event. Actually, it was the huge event in London that year. Um, the, the entire city was crazy about this idea of exhibition. Um, papers, magazines, uh, brochures and so on distributed the idea of this exhibition. When 25,000 people were in the building, they closed the gates, although this is interesting with the birds here. Huh? It's been going on for the entire day. They are complaining. They are so disturbed by what we are doing here. Um, so they closed the building when 25,000 people were in there, although easily 50,000 would have uh, found room. An hour later, cries of jubilation rang out and the thunder of guns announced the arrival of the Queen. A union of all of London's choirs began singing the national anthem, which is interesting because it's really a kind of a ritual that get, brings together, remember Tino asking this morning, what is the meaning of this gathering? Huh? The meaning of that gathering was to bring everything together, the nation, the Queen, the church, under the header of industrial production, no? of production. So a union of all of London's choirs began singing the national anthem. The Archbishop of Canterbury spoke a prior. Handel's Hallelujah chorus was played. And then came the opening of the husband of the queen, uh, which happened to be German, Prince Albert of saxe coburg He was also the chairman of the Royal uh, Exhibition Committee and who said that the goal of this enterprise was, and I'm quoting him here, the beneficial encouragement of all branches of human endeavor and the strengthening of the ties of peace and friendship among the nations on the, uh, of the earth. In the forecourt, by, uh, by the way, when one entered, there were enormous blocks of coal and different kinds of natural resources displayed in the exhibition, plus the anchor of one of the largest warships that was presented. Inside, and now it would be great to have a next, and yeah, you can, can't see much anyway, but um, what you can get an idea of is all these national flags from the different nations that are um, hanging there. Then there were railroad cars, machine tools, weapons, uh, ships, fit, fittings, fabrics, carpets, so craft, trade, um, precision mechanics, the, the sort of central room was um, the large machine hall, which was, was like the mecca of uh, the uh, enthusiasts of progress. There, 
in this room, which people call the soul of the exhibition, essential power made it possible to actually display the machines in operation. So they were running, uh, creating an atmosphere of a factory. A contemporary um, newspaper report wrote, um, there is a roaring, a pounding, a hammering, so that one feels one is located in the largest factory of the world. So you go into an exhibition, but in fact it's the largest factory of the world, and it's running, the machines are producing. So, one can hardly imagine how important this was, because at that time there were no technological universities, there were no technological newspapers. So for most people, for a broad international audience, this was the first time that the paradigm of technological and industrial progress was really, could, could really be experienced, yeah? was laid out, was displayed in a way. Yeah? And of course, behind all this, um, the precondition for all this was a new way of thinking that was trailblazing through industrial production. It was a break with the idea that nature is the actual productive authority, huh? because that was a traditional way of thinking, that in fact nature is productive and humans are only there to complete what nature produces. Huh? And now the turn, and that's the modern idea, to um, the turn to the idea that humans see themselves as productive, as a productive nature, one that drives from inside the formation and assessment of the external world, which now becomes an environment. So that's the crucial shift that takes place. Huh? This, this shift of thinking nature as productive to thinking humans as the actual productive entity. Because with that, production took a, new, took a new dimension categorically. And the Crystal Palace revealed this with all its powers. What was actually celebrated here was the enormous production capability of human beings. And hence, and that's important, the feeling of liberating, liberation from a direct dependency on nature. So that's what is cultivated here. We can liberate ourselves from depending on nature. So, as I said in the beginning, and this now we can maybe show the, the, the last image, um, the Crystal Palace in some ways seems to loom behind the Fun Palace huh? in, their, in their idea to create a new kind of institution in the way they, it's constructed and its temporariness. Um, but, of course, in the, its gigantic dimension and so on. Huh? But, if we relate those, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> but precisely this, this reference, the relation of the two, of course, also shows the crucial and the decisive um, difference huh? in which they differ categorically. While the Crystal Palace celebrates the production paradigm of industrialized societies, its 20th century counterpart in a way, is conceived for a different kind of society, a leisure society, a consumer society, um, a, so a society that to a certain extent is removed from economy, because it's not really products that are displayed there anymore, as, at least when you compare it to the Crystal Palace, which was all about um, displaying products, huh? which, among many other things, implies a different status that the object has. Um, the object as a produced and exhibited object. It loses its central, absolute central status. While now the subjects, Cedric Price would maybe speak of users, so the visitors, their interests, their, ex their experiences, their way of interrelating become the actual focus of the exhibition and the actual object that is to be shaped and... and um, uh, regulated in a way, and in that sense, one could say that it's way, it's 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 it's, a, it's also ahead of its time because this kind of thinking is quite early for the early 60s. I mean, to dedicate to to sh to bring this into a shape of an entire um, uh, institution. No? Um, but now, of course, the question that we're interested in is how can we use this? I mean, how can we use this idea to to think of an institution for the present? I mean. We have been talking about this all, the, all, all day. Um, and inspired by Lucius Burkhardt and Cedric Price, 
if I speak of an institution, I, I don't approach this from the, from the uh, perspective of architecture, but from the perspective of what actually happens in there. What is the kind of ritual that takes place? How are people addressed? What is, what is it that they actually experience? So what, from that perspective, would an, would an institution for the present um, need to achieve or need to provide? First, and this relates back to what I said this morning, it needs opening hours. So why are the opening hours so important? Because the opening hours allow a mass audience to participate. And that's, as I said this morning, the decisive political achievement or cultural achievement of the exhibition in relation to earlier cultural formats. As I said, you know, where the one speaks to the many, which theater still holds on to. The exhibition is a liberal format where the many speak to the many mediated through objects. So, and, and what allows this liberal structure to come into being is the, um, the opening hours because they allow to overcome the modality of the appointment, which is theater. Huh? It's the modality of the appointment, whereas the opening hours allow a more liberal ritual in which people can go and come if, uh, as they like, in which they decide for themselves how much attention, how much time they invest, and so on. No? So that's the sort of structure of the exhibition that corresponds to an equally liberalized or flexibilized sensitivity. So if we want an institution for a mass audience, we need to stick to this liberal frame of the opening hours, not to the modality of the appointment, huh? in a way. So this is point one. The, the, point, the, the second point would be it would, have, it would need to be a ritual that in a true sense is contemporary. So what would that mean if we, come, for instance, compare it to the Crystal Palace? Huh? Um, I would say it means that we have to get rid of the primacy of, this, of the object that the sort of traditional and 20th century model of the exhibition cultivates. Why? What, what, what's the problem with the object? The problem with this primacy of the object is that it comes from that time, huh? from the 19th century. The 19th century as a productivist society, as, a, as, a, as, as the rise of society that is productivist, that is oriented, that derives all its wealth, all its prosperity, but also its identity and its idea of a good life from the production and consum cons con consumption of objects, such that measures itself in terms of what it can produce not in terms of how peaceful it is or how much people can take care of themselves. That was the culture of ancient Greek societies, for instance. No, it's about the object. Huh? And such a, such a, such a, it's no coincidence that such a society creates a ritual that is all cent centered on the cultivation of objects. Huh? Because the, 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 the artifact, the, the aesthetic object, of course, provides a link to this realm of material production, plus it can ennoble this banal thing to the realm of meaning production, uh, to a sort of higher realm of aesthetics. So this idea that the, ex that the exhibition is based on the, on the centrality of the object as the protagonist of meaning production is something that comes from that time and from that think thinking and from a from a paradigm that is the paradigm of production in a way. Yeah? But of course today we more and more leave this paradigm towards a different economy and a different socio-economic structure in which productivity is not so much, or is, uh, in which the productivity of a society increasingly runs, around, runs along processes, huh? runs along services, you could say, but runs along interactions, runs along social processes in the widest sense. And if we think of, I mean, in all I, I'm saying, there's basically one basic idea. Huh? Exhibitions are interesting because the structure of, an exhi of exhibitions mirrors the structure of societies. And precisely because this is, this is, this is the fact, 
the, this, the, the, the structure of, it, of the exhibition has to constantly change and adopt to changes in the socio-economical structure of societies. This happens from early market societies that sort of to a certain extent are mirrored in the encyclopedic museum. That happens in the shift to consumer societies that are mirrored on the white cube. I will speak about all this tomorrow in the, in the little vignettes, so come back if you're interested. But this also ha has to happen today. Yeah? So if we, want, if we are interested in, in the contemporariness of the exhibition ritual, it has to, to a certain extent, mirror in a socioeconomic structure in which, which productivity is generated through social processes. And the traditional exhibition format with its focus on object is very limited in doing that. So in a way we could say after this rather short intermezzo of 200 years where Western culture was obsessed with displaying objects, we can finally get rid of this and focus on the interaction of you guys and among each other of people in a way, you know? which doesn't mean we have to exclude objects, they just have a different status in that. Huh? So um, this was point two. Point three is also something I spoke about earlier, the need to overcome this idea of the exhibition. Because the exhibited object implies an idea of separation, and this idea of separation is the basic modality of modernity. So we have to, which was, as I said earlier, extremely productive, politically, in terms of thinking, economically, but which to a certain extent has fulfilled its duty. Whereas we are today much more faced with the question of how to bring all these things that have been connect, a disconnected nature from culture, products, from processes, a rationality from different kinds of senses and knowledges and forms of knowledge and so on. So how to bring this back together? So the question is how to think modalities of, of uh, connecting and interconnectedness, which refers to Margaret Mead, uh, to the Margaret Mead text I earlier spoke about. So how can we think of an exhibition ritual or of a new kind of a Western ritual that in fact addresses the entire human, the entire being and in all its senses and it's all, in all its um, energies, not just rational, rationally, but also as a, as a physical being, as a, as a spiritual being, as a tra transcendent being. And which also means to interweave different modalities and different traditions. Huh? And what I spoke about this morning, this idea of an individualized space, event space, which is also what the Swiss Pavilion presents. Huh? a space that is a hybrid between exhibition and event, that is on the one hand time-based, which is kind of an event space, but on the other hand still keeps this liberal structure and that that sense is individualized. Huh? So this, this goes into that direction. And point four, and this is something new I haven't mentioned so far, and some, uh, something rather speculative that I would raise as a question is to which extent could, could or should have such an institution a fixed place, right? Because the exhibition format as it raises in the 19th century, is, and, 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 and this is also true for the Crystal Palace, is very much linked to the idea of the nation. Whereas we today live in a time of global economy, of global networks and so on, so the question is where could be a space which is non-virtual, um, where people can actually experience themselves as global citizens, as world citizens, uh, so to speak. Huh? So the question is, could or should, should an institution for the presence have one fixed place? Or should it be movable, transferable to different cultural and ge uh, geographic contexts? So we don't know how the Fun Palace would have, uh, how the Fun Palace would have looked like in the end, but and what would have happened here, there exactly. But from all the attempts to create a new kind of institutions, the Fun Palace seems to be the one that comes the closest to all these ideas that I so far mentioned. It relativizes the hegemonic role of visual art and counters it with other formats and modalities, interweaves it with other formats and modalities. People can meet, they encounter each other, but in a sort of active and shaped way. 
although we of course don't know how this actually would have functioned in the Fun Palace. Um, and, it's a, and, and he always thought of it as a place that in, in, in this case was, was conceived to happen in London, but he writes in these papers, and you can read all this on, in, in the plans, that he thought it could happen anywhere else. Huh? So it was thought as a sort of transferable or movable or flexible um, structure. So again, and I said this earlier, I think the point, the point is to use it as a, as a model, as, a, as an impulse, huh? as, a, um, as a reference to think, to think modalities for an institution uh, and, and how it could look like, like today, or as Margaret Mead would say, something like a new kind of Western, contemporary Western ritual. Thank you for staying <laughs> this marathon. I'm I'm totally happy if you